Good evening. I'm Dick Levinson, and I am honored to have the opportunity tonight to introduce H.W. Brands and an evening devoted to his very important new book, Reagan, The Life. As a mark of respect for our speaker, I'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phones now and a, a gentle reminder that neither photography nor audio recording are permitted. But at the end of the program tonight, do join us upstairs where Professor Brand will be signing copies of his book. In thinking about H.W. Brands and his career, I thought a little bit about a great 19th century college professor and president, Mark Hopkins. James Garfield once said of him that the ideal college education would be a log with Mark Hopkins on one end and myself on the other. And I mention that because I think in years to come, that's really how people will think about H.W. Brands, and for several reasons. First of all, because of the, um, the way in which he's brought back the drama, the excitement, the great stories that make American history what it is and what it should be. And secondly, I, I'm astounded that a 61-year-old man has managed to write 25 consequential books, two of which were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. And I'm referring, uh, first of all, to his book about Benjamin Franklin, The First American, as well as his book about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a traitor to his class. And, you know, I have to say that who else but H.W. Brands could conceive of the idea of writing a history of the United States that was shaped by the traditional Japanese form, the haiku, which, as you know, is limited to 37 syllables. Well, Professor Brands has been working on this history in haiku for quite some time. He's been publishing the results on his website and uh, on Twitter, which you can check for yourself. And uh, he feels that he'll be finished in about two years from now. Um, one of the things that I particularly like about the professor's website is that he has a whole series of natural laws uh, that, that govern human behavior, each of which is very interesting uh, to true students of history. And <clears throat> you and I might see this differently, but he believes, for example, that monsters, including the current dictator of North Korea, actually sleep very well at night because the human capacity for self-delusion and self-justification is simply unlimited. H.W. Brands was educated at some of the finest institutions on the West Coast, including the Jesuit High School of Greater Portland, Stanford University, and Reed College. He currently teaches at the University of Texas at Austin, and it is now my pleasure to turn the program over to him. Thank you, Dick, for that very kind introduction. Thank you all for coming this evening. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's very fitting, I think, for me anyway. It's, it's gratifying for me to be back in Philadelphia talking about the sixth volume in my series of biographies that together are supposed to sum up to a history of the United States, because the first volume is on the life of Benjamin Franklin. And I spoke in Philadelphia when the book came out. Very briefly, I was, uh, as a young man, I was more ambitious than I am today, and perhaps less realistic. And I pitched an idea to a publisher that I wanted to write a history of the United States in several volumes. I was thinking five or six volumes. And I was speaking to this publisher at a convention of historians, and the publisher sort of smiled and then laughed and said, no, this will never fly. No one is ever going to publish this, and no one would ever read it if you did. And so I was, I was uh, somewhat discouraged. And I put it out of my mind for a while, but I came back to it because I thought it was, I thought it was a good idea. I, th I liked the idea of having a single author guide the reader, guide readers through the course of American history. I was familiar with the standard practice of writing textbooks on American history, and usually it's to farm it out 
to four, five, six experts in particular fields. And at the time, actually when I was young and had not yet become an author of a book like this, I thought it was because you would get an expert on colonial history writing the first part of the book, and then you get an expert on early national America writing about that, an expert on the Gilded Age writing about that, an expert on the 20th century, and so on. And that's part of the reason. It turns out the other part of the reason is that the more authors whose names appear on the title page of the textbook, the more graduate students they have seated in various colleges and universities around the country who would be inclined to adopt the textbook and boost the sales. Anyway, so I briefly put out of my mind the idea that I was going to write this history of the United States in multiple volumes. And actually, I will tell you what the, the publisher said, and I, I will be able to guess your ages by your response to what the publisher said. The publisher said, who do you think you are anyway? Will Durant? Okay, well, those of you who chuckled knowing who Will Durant was are people of a certain age, because for those of you who are younger, Will and Ariel Durant wrote uh, something like a 25-volume hist history of the human race, the story of civilization. And, in fact, when the publisher said this, I, my initial reaction was to say, yeah, that's exactly who I'd like to be. Because I had read, I won't say all of them, but most of them, and I thought it was absolutely intriguing. So I put out of my mind very briefly the idea that I was going to write these as histories. But I came back to them because I still thought it was a good idea. And I decided that I was going to do it not by declaring ahead of time that this was going to be a history of the United States in six volumes by H.W. Brands. I was going to write it surreptitiously. I was going to do it covertly. And part of the covert cover was going to be that it was a series of biographies rather than of histories. And this because I had been paying attention to what people read, what kind of books make the bestseller list. And very few of them say a history of this or a history of that. A lot of them are biographies. And this because, well, people very often, and I could poll you, or I won't ask you to raise your hands, at least not on this question, but some people have a rather unfortunate recollection of the history classes that they took in high school because they often involved worksheets that had you memorizing particular events and dates and matching the dates with the events and all this. And all sorts of people tend to think that history is about memorizing things and putting them in order. And part of this is that, well, when you have to teach to a test, that's what sometimes happens. Another thing is, and I don't know if this is the case in Pennsylvania. I've been living in Texas for the last 35 years. I can tell you it definitely is the case in Texas. And that is that a lot of people will remember of their high school class, first of all, that was kind of dry, and secondly, they can't always remember the, what the last name of their high school history teacher was, but they're pretty sure that the first name was Coach. <laughs> and it wouldn't occur to most high school principals that they would put somebody hired primarily to be a football or a basketball coach in a classroom teaching math. You have to know something to teach math. But you don't really have to know anything to teach history. You just read the textbook the night before, and you can, you know, you're half a step ahead of your students. Anyway, so I decided that I was going to write a history of the United States in the form of these biographies. And the biographies were going to be linked in the following way. I would choose an individual who would represent a certain period or era in American history, who somehow is emblematic of that period. So the volume one in the series wasn't actually the first one that I wrote. It was the second one I wrote. But volume one was on Benjamin Franklin. And the title of the book was, is, The First American. And this because it seemed to me that the defining task of American history at the time, if I can use that terminology, was the creation of an American identity. Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, you name anybody of that generation. They were all born English men and English women. They died Americans. How did that happen? So that's the first one. The second volume in the series became Andrew Jackson. And I chose Andrew Jackson in part because he symbolized, he represented the overriding task of the next generation. Now, one of the things that I tried to do was to find individuals who were stepping onto the stage of history as adults when the previous subject was dying. So Benjamin Franklin died in 1790 at which point Andrew Jackson was 23 years old. He was becoming an adult. He was practicing law, 
and fighting Indians in frontier Tennessee. And Jackson lived until 1845. And with Jackson, the fundamental task of his generation was the establishment of the idea and the principle of democracy. The idea that ordinary people, people like you and me, can guide the future of this country through the political system. Because with Benjamin Franklin, there was a creation of an independent republic, and there was the establishment of a constitution, but it was not a constitution that broke the idea of democracy in the sense of ordinary people actually having political power. That took another generation. And Jackson is the first really democratically elected president. And that model has been imprinted on American presidential politics ever since. The third subject of biography is one that I actually, that's the most recently one written, and it's about Ulysses Grant. And this is all about, the book is called The Man Who Saved the Union. And I will be the first to acknowledge that in titles, maybe I, I won't say that I claim too much, but I push the claim as far as it will go. Was Benjamin Franklin really the first American? He was one of the first. Did Ulysses Grant save the Union? Yes, but not by himself. Anyway, but the point there is, how does the Union stay together in the middle of the sectional crisis, the Civil War, and Reconstruction? And Grant is right in the middle of all of that. The next volume is about Theodore Roosevelt, the subtitle of which, and the title is TR, the subtitle is The Last Romantic. Sometimes Theodore Roosevelt is seen as this precursor to the 20th century, and in some ways he was, but to me the more important thing was he was kind of a throwback or a holdover from the 19th century which was, of course, when he was born. He was born in 1858. He was really a child of the Civil War. And in trying to restore the authority of government in the face of modern industrialization, he was thinking of an earlier time. The fifth volume in the series was Franklin Roosevelt, who leads the United States through the Great Depression and World War II. Roosevelt dies in 1945, which left me, as I pondered volume six, who I should write about. Should it be? Well, I had not intended when I started out that these figures would be mostly presidents. In fact, it turns out that five of the six are presidents. And this was, I won't say this was forced upon me, but it, it came naturally because of the fact that I initially conceived of this series as being a history of the United States. And if I was going to find biographical subjects that I could essentially hang the history of the United States on, I needed somebody in each generation who was at the center of things. And if I had chosen, for example, an author, a scientist, a social reformer, there would be a lot of important events that I would have to cover that would be fairly far afield from my biographical subject. The other thing is, that I didn't intend this at all, and those of you who are familiar with the academic world might be aware of this, but in the academic world, there are no such things as presidential historians. Presidential historian is a label that has been created by the media to put, well, if, when I'm on TV sometimes, they'll put H.W. Rand's presidential historian, because I've written about presidents, and that's something that the general public understands. So anyhow, so it was, it became, something that was easy to identify with. And I'll tell you one other thing, that when you, when you write books, and, I'm, and I will be perfectly candid in saying, I was writing these books for a general audience. I had written for an academic audience, the specialized academic audience, until I got tenure, at which point I could write about pretty much whatever I wanted. <laughs> and, and the reason I say this is that I have long considered my reading audience to be an extension of my classroom. I make a point of teaching, among other things, introductory classes. I teach at the University of Texas. And I want to get the students in in their first semester, because I think it's great, getting these 19-year-olds who are so fresh-faced and the world is open to them. It keeps me young. But also, it sort of reminds me that most of the world is not as intrinsically interested in history as those of us who make a living at it are. So I want to sort of reach out to that group. Anyway, so I have to figure out who's going to be the sequel to Franklin Roosevelt. I need somebody who's an adult by then, but I also need somebody who in some ways encapsulates the American experience in the second half of the 20th century. I thought about, I briefly thought about Lyndon Johnson, 
And Lyndon Johnson would be good. He's the president who's most responsible for the civil rights revolution of the 1960s. But my problem there is that Johnson leaves office at the beginning of 1969. He dies in 1973. And I got a quarter century to cover. I was aiming for at least the 21st century. Maybe not the present. Maybe not 2015. That's a moving target. But at least I wanted to get, and I did not want to do seven volumes. By volume six was going to be enough. So Johnson leaves office too soon. I thought about Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon carries the story a little bit farther forward. And Richard Nixon has an appeal for a biographer because there is this, in Nixon's case very obvious, dark streak in the individual. And you know about how Tolstoy said that every happy family is alike. It's the unhappy families that are interesting. Well, I think the same thing is true with individuals. But this can go only so far. When I was thinking about when I was thinking about the book that became the biography of Ulysses Grant, I was toying with who should it be. It should be, a, I wanted to have a soldier because during that period of American history, military power, military success in holding the Union together, in creating the modern United States geographically by defeating Mexico, by defeating the Indians was essential. So I wanted to write about a soldier. And I wanted to write about a soldier who really before he became successful as a soldier, showed little promise in anything else. And I remember, actually, I was on a book tour. I was doing a, a book tour uh, for a book that I wrote on Andrew Jackson. And on these book tours, and by the way, I'm on a book tour now, um, in these book tours, what happens is you start off in the morning, and you go to an airport, and you fly on a plane, and you go somewhere, and you go to a hotel, and then you go to an event like this, you go to a bookstore, and then you go to a hotel, next morning you get up on a, get an airplane, Airplane, hotel, bookstore, airplane, hotel, bookstore, until you really can't remember where you are. So I was giving a talk about Andrew Jackson. And at the end of the, the Jackson talk, and this was one of those talks where those of you, if you've been in teaching, you've ever been in a position where you've been in front of an audience, you can tell when the audience is with you, when they're paying attention, when you know, the room kind of warms up. And this, this was a great audience. And they were really with me. They, they liked Andrew Jackson. So at the end, of, uh, there was a question and answer toward the end, and the question came up, so who are you going to write about next? And I was reflecting on the fact that I wanted to write about a soldier, and I wanted to write about somebody who really wasn't that good at other things besides being a soldier, and I really wanted to write about somebody who had kind of a dark streak in him, because that makes him just that much more interesting. Somebody who is happy all the time, what fun is that? And I said, and the person who seems to fit this bill to me the best is William Sherman. And within 15 seconds, the temperature in the room dropped about 35 degrees. And I realized, oh my gosh, I'm in Atlanta. <laughs> well, so that was another consideration. And that made me decide not to write about Nixon. Because Nixon is one of those downers. And you know, there may be, maybe you've heard the rule of thumb about Broadway musicals. That you can tell it's going to be a success if the people come out of the theater whistling the theme song. I couldn't imagine anybody coming out of reading a book about Richard Nixon, you know, whistling, well, I don't know, what the theme of Watergate or something like that. <laughs> anyway, so I decided to write about Reagan. And I, wrote about, I decided to write about Reagan, first of all, because logistically, in terms of his life and his dates, he's perfect. He is fully an adult by 1945, by the time Franklin Roosevelt dies. Furthermore, Reagan, in 1945, is a proud New Deal Democrat. He is someone who voted for Franklin Roosevelt four times, someone who fully absorbed the philosophy of the welfare state while Reagan, well, excuse me, while Roosevelt was president. And then, who in the course of his political career changed his political philosophy 180 degrees. And I wanted, and for Reagan, for me, that's perfect. Because to me, the big story about American politics, start, and start with in American politics, but I would say in some ways broader American life, is the turn to the right in American politics starting about, well, about 1980, about the time Ronald Reagan was elected. And I was able, I think, to make the case that when I was writing about Franklin Roosevelt, that from... 1932 or thereabouts, until around 1980, the United States lived in what you could call the age of Franklin Roosevelt. And I would make the case to you, and we can certainly talk about this when we have questions, and I certainly uh, invite your objections, but I would say that since 1980, we have lived in the age of Ronald Reagan. 
Now, and plenty of people think that this is a good idea, and plenty of people think this is a terrible idea. But the, and I'll elaborate on this a little bit more why I think this, but now I'll get a little bit closer to Reagan himself. And I'm going to tell you uh, a story. And it's a story that goes like this. Ronald Reagan, I, I need to give you a little bit of background. So Reagan was a child in Illinois. He grew up in Illinois. He went to college in Illinois. After college, he went into radio. And then he went into Hollywood. He went into film. And his career went like this. So here he is in college. He started acting, actually, on a small stage like this in his mother's church. It was the Disciples of Christ Church in Dixon, Illinois. And he discovered that there was something very charming. In fact, the word he used to refer to the feeling he got when he heard the applause of audience. He said the applause was like music to his ears. He was a child who had a great number of anxieties, starting with the fact that his father was an alcoholic. In fact, I will share with you an experience I had when doing research for the Reagan book. This, again, uh, connects to uh, a book tour that I was doing. And it was, this one was a book tour about Ulysses Grant. And I was talking to a radio host where we were doing a radio show. And at the end of the hour, there have been call-ins and various questions about Grant. And toward the end, he asked a question that often comes up in cases like this, as it had in the previous case. So what's your next book? What, who are you working on now? And I said I was working on Ronald Reagan. Now, I had no reason to think that this particular individual had any expertise in Ronald Reagan. So I was a little bit surprised when he put his hand over the microphone and he said, we didn't get feedback like that, but um, he said, when we get off the air, there's something I need to tell you about Ronald Reagan. Okay, I'm interested. What does he know about Ronald Reagan? So we got off the air and I said, yeah, tell me. He said, if you want to understand Ronald Reagan, the thing you need to keep foremost in mind is that Reagan was the son of an alcoholic father. Now, I knew this. The world knew this. The world that was paying attention knew this because Reagan had reported on this in both of the memoirs that he wrote. His first memoir was published in 1965 when Reagan was running for governor of California. So it was a campaign biography. The second one was written after his political career had ended, so a quarter century later, and it's called American Life. But in both cases, he tells the story of how his father, Jack, he and his brother, Neil, addressed their parents by their first names. So it was Jack and Nell. And he tells, he tells the story about how Jack, well, the way he put it was that his father had a problem with alcohol. He didn't use the term alcoholic, but he, one thing he said was that his mother explained to the two children, two boys in the family, that their father had this illness. So alcoholism as an illness. And they should feel sympathy for their father and cut him some slack. And Reagan, in his memoir, relates that version as being essentially the version that he adopted. But there's a particular moment when something deeper comes out. And I remembered this and I went back to check when, after speaking to the radio host who said, the thing you need to remember about Ronald Reagan is that he was the son of an alcoholic father. Because the radio host proceeded to elaborate. He said, I speak not as an expert on Ronald Reagan, but as the son of an alcoholic father. And I will tell you that when you grow up under those circumstances, you develop a certain kind of emotional reflex. And it comes from the fact that one day, your father is your best friend, and you're throwing the baseball around in the backyard, and he's telling you funny stories, and he takes you out for ice cream. And the next day, he's beating the living daylights out of you. And on any given day, you wake up, and you don't know which person you're going to deal with. And as a result of this, you build this kind of wall around yourself emotionally. You don't, just out of self-defense, you don't allow yourself to be thrown backwards and forwards by these violent disruptions in your emotional life. You keep the emotional world at a distance. Now, I had observed this myself in Reagan and in the reactions that Reagan inspired in other people. 
including his wife, Nancy, who was closer to Reagan than any person on earth. And Nancy Reagan wrote a memoir, which if you haven't read it, it's worth reading, if only because it is about the most candid memoir of any public figure in the last 50 years that I've read. And she was candid even regarding her husband, even regarding his emotional life. And Nancy said that there were times when even I didn't know what was going on in his heart, that that wall, that curtain would come down and he would keep me at a distance too. So the radio host said, you know, you don't know what kind of father you're going to deal with. And I was aware of this, the fact that Reagan had kept people at a distance and there's a particular story that Reagan relates in the memoir in which he describes himself at about the age of 11 coming home from school late one afternoon. It's in the middle of winter in Prairie, Illinois. There, Dixon, Illinois, on the Illinois prairies. And there's snow on the ground, there's snow drifts around the house, the temperature is well below freezing. And as he walks up the front, walk to the house, there's his father passed out in the snow. And Reagan, the memoirist writing from the age of 80, thinking back 70 years, says, and I stood there and I had to decide, do I wake him up and get him inside or do I let him freeze to death in the snow? Now, very quickly, he goes on in the next sentence to say, and so I woke him up and brought him inside. But the mere fact that a young boy could think, even for a moment, that his life would be better if his father were dead, to me, that says a lot about the emotional development of this individual. And there are all sorts of, there's all sorts of testimony that supports this. Reagan was somebody who, at a distance, seemed like a friendly guy. He had a smiling face, and I'm going to come back to this, and give you the formula. Uh, I can't tell what your politics are, but if anybody in here is rooting for a Republican to win in 2016, I'm going to give you the formula for victory. And if anybody here is rooting for the Republicans to lose, then you can bury this information and not tell anybody you heard about it. Okay, anyway. Um, so Reagan gave the impression of being this friendly guy. And one of the reasons that he was seen as so friendly was, well, he used to tell stories, and one was like this. Here's a story that Reagan used to tell. And it actually relates to himself, as a lot of these did. This is one where Reagan is about to give a speech in a town where he's never spoken before. So Reagan went to Hollywood, and his film career went up like this, and then it just kind of went like that. And eventually, he couldn't get any good roles. In part, well, in part, one of the reasons he couldn't get any really good roles was that he couldn't go to that emotional place where actors have to go to portray really emotional, dramatic roles. Reagan was always sort of the next guy. In fact, when Reagan announced in 1965 that he was running for governor of California, Samuel Goldwyn, of Metro Goldwyn mayor, heard about this, and he said, no, no, Jimmy Stewart for governor, Ronald Reagan for best friend. That's the role that Reagan was best in. So Reagan loses his job, basically loses his job in Hollywood. He gets demoted to television, which was really a demotion in the early 1950s. The small screen was really small, and it was black and white, and it just didn't do justice to anybody. But what was even more humbling than that was, so Reagan was the host of the General Electric Theater, which meant that national audience would see him for three minutes on Sunday night when he would introduce this television play. But he spent the rest of his time, he spent the working week, out basically as a walking infomercial for GE, preaching the benefits of big business, the benefits of General Electric, the benefits of American capitalism. And so he found himself in small towns all over the country. And in this story, Reagan is about to give a speech in some small town where he's never been before and the people don't know him. 
And the person who was going to introduce him saw his name in writing, Ronald R-E-A-G-A-N. And he does not know how that name is pronounced. Reagan was insufficiently famous that everybody at that point knew how the name was pronounced. He didn't know if it was Reagan or Regan. And it could be pronounced either way. So he's trying to figure out, what am I going to do? Because it was a luncheon address. And that morning he was walking around and he was afraid he was going to embarrass himself and pronounce it wrong. And he didn't want to do that. So he's out walking around the town that morning. And he happens to run into a neighbor. A neighbor who's out walking his dog. Uh, a cute little hound-like dog of some sort. And so the guy who's the introducer stops the neighbor and says, I got this problem. I wonder if you can help me with it. I have to introduce this guy, Ronald something or other. And do you know, is it Reagan or Regan? And the guy says, oh, it's Reagan. Oh, it's Reagan. You've heard, that, you've heard it pronounced. It's Reagan. Yeah, yeah, it's Reagan. Not Regan. Reagan. Now, you're sure it's Reagan. Yeah, it's Reagan. Good. All right. Well, thanks. Boy, you have really spared me some embarrassment. Thanks a lot. I, I just can't thank you too much. And he starts to walk away. And he says, oh, by the way, that's a really cute dog you've got. What kind is it? A bagel. <laughs> so, anyway, actually, I'm going to tell you another story. And this one is, I spoke last night in Dallas at the Highland Park United Methodist Church. And it's one of the largest congregations in the United States. I was told it has 17,000 members. And the story I'm going to tell you is perhaps more appropriate for that venue than this being a public library. But you'll catch the point. This is one that Reagan told to a convention of evangelical ministers meeting in Florida in 1983. And as Reagan tells the story, there was a beloved, good minister who dies on a particular day. And it just so happened that at the same, on the same day, at about the same time, a politician dies. And their souls ascend to heaven. And they happen to meet at the pearly gates, where they are greeted by St. Peter. And St. Peter says, ah, yeah, you're both getting in, and I will show you to your quarters. So they go walking around together, and they've gone a little bit, and St. Peter stops in front of this bare room that had no decorations, a single small room, a cell, basically, with a cot for a bed, a table, a straight back chair, no other comforts or adornments. And the politician is thinking, okay, I guess this is mine. St. Peter surprises him and gives it to the minister. And the politician is starting, now he's really starting to get nervous because thinks if the minister, the, the holy man of the cloth, gets that, what am I going to get? So they walk on a little farther and they stop to the politician's amazement in front of this elaborate mansion a great big residence with all of the luxuries of residential life. And St. Peter says, and this is for you. And the politician says, I don't get it. How can this be? Why that good, holy man of the cloth got that bare cell and I get this? And St. Peter says, well, you got to understand how it is here in heaven. We've got lots of ministers. You're the first politician who ever made it in. Okay. Now, the reason I told you those stories is partly to get a chuckle, but primarily to explain to you one of Ronald Reagan's secrets of political success. Reagan, and I will, here I will tell you what the secret for Republican political success is. So if you're rooting for Republicans, write this down. If you're not rooting for Republicans, you can pretend you never heard it. But at least it worked for Ronald Reagan. It was this. Reagan burst on the political scene in 1964. Almost no one in the United States knew that Reagan had any interest in politics. And fewer people than that thought he had any career in politics. In fact, 
Reagan gave a speech in late October 1964 on behalf of Barry Goldwater, the Republican nominee for president, the most conservative candidate the Republicans had nominated certainly since the 1920s, known for his conservatism, proud of his conservatism. And polls showed that he was going to go down to a disastrous defeat to the very liberal candidate, Lyndon Johnson. The, the Goldwater campaign, desperate to do something to revive the campaign, if only to bring in donations so they wouldn't end up the campaign deeply in debt, agreed to put Reagan on national television. Some of Reagan's California friends who had known him paid for the recording, and it was a tribute around the country. And Reagan gave this speech. No, in part because most people, if they had any re recollection of Reagan, they didn't know who he was. He, he really wasn't famous, and he certainly wasn't famous in political context. So the expectations were low. And you could say that Reagan knocked it out of the park. He gave this speech that simply galvanized the Republican Party and even caused a lot of Democrats to pay attention. To show how effective this single speech was, first of all, I will tell you that those people who like Ronald Reagan, who consider themselves Reagan fans, they, to this day, refer to this speech as the speech. And if you just say the speech to anybody who knows Reagan, they know exactly what you're talking about, October 1964. This speech was one that converted this guy that no one had heard of, basically, certainly not in a political context, two days before, into someone who, the morning of the next day, Ronald Reagan for president, committees were formed in various states around the country. He hadn't even thought of politically. And Republicans around the country were smacking their hands to their foreheads saying, we nominated the wrong guy. If we had nominated this guy, we'd have a chance to win. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Now, it took a while. It wasn't automatic. Reagan had to become governor of California. He had to run for the Republican nomination for president twice before he got it. But when Reagan got it in 1980, he was elected decisively in 1980 and reelected overwhelmingly in 1984 signaling that a sea change had set in in American politics. In 1964, Reagan's speech did not save Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater lost, basically, the, the liberal candidate, Lyndon Johnson, won with 60% of the vote. 20 years later, the conservative candidate, Ronald Reagan, won with 60% of the vote. The Reagan presidency represented a reversal of the liberal tide that had set in, starting with Franklin Roosevelt. So if the era from 1930 to 1980 was the era of Franklin Roosevelt, I would argue that the era from 1980 until today is the era of Ronald Reagan in the following sense. From Roosevelt through Lyndon Johnson, new federal programs came often and easily. The general thinking was if there is a large social problem, government is the solver of first resort. When Reagan became president, Reagan famously or notoriously said in his first inaugural address that in our current situation, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem itself. And I would argue that that's the attitude that most Americans have taken. That's essentially the attitude that American political discourse has taken since Reagan. And if you simply look, if you count up the number of new federal programs from Franklin Roosevelt through Lyndon Johnson, we're talking about hundreds. There have been a few new programs since Reagan came along, but very many fewer, and they almost always have to fight for their lives. And the best current example is the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, which was passed by a very slim majority, all Democrats in 2010, and it remains at the hands of the Supreme Court. In two weeks from now, we'll know whether it survived or not. But it's an example of how Reagan's presidency, and I'm not going to say Reagan himself caused this. In fact, one of the points that I make in the book, and one of the things that comes out of all of these books together, is that biography can carry you only so far in understanding history. We tend to say that 
Andrew Jackson did this. Abraham Lincoln did that. Lyndon Johnson did that. What we, that's really shorthand for saying this stuff happened during the presidency of this person. Lyndon Johnson did not by himself effect the civil rights revolution of the 1960s. Martin Luther King had a lot to do with it, and there were all sorts of other people, thousands of people who did. In the same way, Ronald Reagan did not by himself accomplish the two great goals of his presidency. And one of the reasons for Reagan's success was that he was highly focused. There were two things he wanted to accomplish, two things he said again and again, this is what I want to do. Number one, shrink government at home. Number two, defeat communism abroad. Reagan succeeded 50% in shrinking government at home. He cut taxes, and in fact, it's significant that the Republican Party, until Reagan, when you ask Republicans what characterized their party on fiscal issues, it was adherence to the balanced budget. That's what defined Republican conservatives until Reagan. Since Reagan, it's been tax cuts. And you'll notice that the two aren't the same thing at all. In fact, what happened with Reagan was Reagan presented to Congress the idea for tax cuts and spending cuts. He got tax cuts, and he got a promise for spending cuts. The tax cuts he took to the bank. The spending cuts he never quite got. Now, Reagan went to retirement and then went to his grave saying that that was the fault of those Democrats led by Tip O'Neill in Congress, that they just were too attached to their spending programs. But Reagan, the realist, would have acknowledged that this was a consequence of a fateful decision that he had made. Until Reagan came along, those Republican conservatives always conditioned tax cuts on spending cuts. You don't get the tax cuts until you agree to cut spending. Because any political realist understands that tax cuts are easy. Even though Democrats will often resist, they know that they can go back to their constituents and say, hey, I cut your taxes. Now reelect me. And people say, okay, sure. It's a lot harder to cut spending. And in fact, by severing the connection between tax cuts and spending cuts, Reagan essentially guaranteed the structural deficits the country has experienced ever since. There was a brief respite in the late 1990s. And this actually in response to his vice president, George H.W. Bush, going back on the principle of tax cuts, which is cost, what cost Bush his reelection in 1992. On the foreign side, though, Reagan wanted to defeat communism. When Reagan became president, the idea that the United States actually might defeat communism seemed way too much to ask. Okay, you manage this relationship. Remember, this was 1970s with the era of detente, coexistence. Communism will be around for a long time, we'll be around for a long time, we'll get along with each other. Reagan said, no, we are going to defeat communism. We're going to win the Cold War. And in fact, the United States did win the Cold War, not entirely because of Reagan. Mikhail Gorbachev had a lot to do with this. And in fact, one of the points I make in the book is that Reagan, like all great successes, and I'm going to say success because it was success in his own terms. Again, opinions differ whether those terms were good or bad, but he was a success in his own terms. Great successes in public life depend on good timing. I would even go so far as to say good luck. And in Reagan's case, the good timing took the form of the good luck of being president shortly after Paul Volcker became chairman of the Federal Reserve. It was Volcker, not Ronald Reagan, who wrung the inflationary expectations out of the economy, the inflation that so enervated the American economy during the 1970s. And on the foreign side, it was Mikhail Gorbachev who was in a position to make the reforms, to make the compromises that did give rise inadvertently from Gorbachev's standpoint to the end of communism in the Soviet Union. If not for Gorbachev, Reagan would have been seeking an interlocutor in the Soviet Union. He never would have found it. If Leonid, if Leonid Brezhnev had lived another six years, Ronald Reagan would not have achieved in foreign affairs what he hoped to achieve and what he largely did achieve. So I have spoken longer than I intended to speak, but I have to give you the formula for Republican victory. And it's this. And it's the reason I told you those stories. Ronald Reagan began nearly every speech with a joke. And the jokes were about as funny or not so funny as the ones I told you. They would get a chuckle. That's all he was aiming for. He didn't want to be the next David Letterman or the next Johnny Carson or whatever, whoever was around at that point. He just wanted to loosen up the audience because in those wilderness years when Reagan was watching his political career go out from under him, 
he discovered that if he could get an audience to laugh with him, he was halfway to getting an audience to agree with him. And this is something that worked very much in Reagan's favor. The secret of Reagan's success politically, and this is something that is reproducible, perhaps, is that Reagan put a friendly face on American conservatism. The difference between Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson, excuse me, and Ronald Reagan. Goldwater was the one who lost disastrously in 1964. Reagan was the one who won dramatically in 1980 and 84. The difference was not their philosophy. Reagan's philosophy was Goldwater's philosophy right down the line. But Goldwater was stern. Goldwater was angry. Goldwater was scary. Reagan was just the opposite of those. Reagan was that rare, and I would say in American politics, essentially the unique conservative who was appealing, who drew people in. Conservatives tend to be pessimistic. They tend to cultivate a kind of righteous indignation. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, and we're the only ones who know how to fix it. Reagan said the world's, America's not going to hell in a handbasket. America is indeed that shining city on a hill, and its greatest days are ahead of it. Now, I happen to think, in my observation of American history, that Americans generally lean slightly to the right of center on the issue of where should, where's the balance between the public sector and the private sector. I say slightly right of center because Americans believe, now they don't always act on this, but they like to think of themselves as individualists. They would rather do things for themselves than have government do, them, do it for them. So they're set up to respond to the conservative message. But when most conservatives are these angry types or these pessimistic types, nobody wants to vote for that. You put a smiling face, an optimistic face, you put Reagan's face on that conservative message and you've got political magic. I think it would work really well. So if Ted Cruz could have an emotional transplant, he might be the guy. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions. So we have microphones. There's a question in the back. And we have another microphone over here in case anybody on this side of the house wants to ask a question. As I follow up to your formula, I, o I always noticed that Ronald Reagan always spoke positively. It seemed to very, very regular, rarely, if, it, if there's something wrong, you very rarely say anything negatively. Would you agree with that? And I would agree that with that, and I would is? actually elaborate on it a little bit. In this case, I mentioned earlier that Reagan, in his early years, identified himself as a Franklin Roosevelt Democrat. Even after his philosophy changed, he took Roosevelt as his model of how to be president. And I would just say, having written about a bunch of presidents, the thing that characterizes the great presidents are the ones who know how to be president, how to perform the presidency. And the essence of this is how to connect with the American people. Because the president has certain powers under the Constitution, but his greatest power is to mobilize public opinion because our political system does respond to mobilized political opinion. And Reagan watched Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt, being a Democrat, never criticized Republicans. He criticized Republican leaders. He was asked about this. He said, I want Republicans to vote for me. And so he never criticized Republicans. He never spoke evil of ordinary people. Reagan was just the other, was, was the same way. He never spoke evil of Democrats. He would speak, I won't say unkindly, but he would speak critically of Democratic leaders. But he wanted Democrats to vote for him. And in fact, Reagan Democrats were an important part of his constituency. So this is part of not speaking ill of people, just saying nice things. Um, he could be critical, he, he, he could definitely be critical of foreign leaders, they don't vote in American elections. But he certainly was never critical of the American people. And there's a really interesting irony that comes out of this. Reagan repeatedly said that the only problem with America is its government. Now I have to point out that in that famous line where Reagan says government's not the solution, government's the problem, the introductory clause of that was in our current situation, Reagan was not anti-government per se, because if he had been, how in the world would he explain running for president? And in fact, one of the members of the Reagan administration, whom I interviewed for the book, I asked him about this, and he said, no, no, we weren't against government. He said, we were conservatives, not anarchists. But Reagan, would, Reagan repeatedly blamed the problems of America on American government, as though in a democracy, 
of all political systems. Government had nothing to do with the people. So you get this kind of weird situation where the people are the source of all goodness, government is the source of all badness, but we got this democracy where who do you think chose those members of government? But it was a circle that Reagan never tried to square. There were lots of circles that Reagan never tried to square. And that, again, was one of the secrets of Reagan's success. And I will say this as no particular compliment to Reagan, except that it showed that he was canny, and no particular compliment to the American political system. But the, the most successful candidates are the ones who promise the world even though any reasonable person knows you're not going to get the world. You know, sometimes the formula that I just gave you for Republican success, I think of in terms of, okay, think of another candidate who was very optimistic, who preached a message of hope with a slogan of, I don't know, you know, yes, we can. I mean, this is what candidates do. This is what Reagan did. So if you want to understand the Reagan phenomenon, it's the philosophy of Barry Goldwater with the presence of Barack Obama. Put those two together, and I think you got a formula for victory in 2016. Other questions? Yes, sir. Besides being the pitch man for uh, GE, was there a transformational moment that changed Reagan from a New Deal Democrat to a conservative? Ah, this is a very apt question. It's a question that I have an, an answer for, but I'm not thoroughly confident I have the right answer. Reagan explained his transformation as one beginning in the late 1940s, amid the emerging Cold War that took a personal facet for Reagan, in that Reagan was head of the Screen Actors Guild in Hollywood at a time of a very bitter inter-union dispute over who's going to represent the behind-the-camera groups in Hollywood. And there was an existing union and a new union that was very radically oriented. And many of the guiding spirits in that union had been avowed members of the Communist Party during the 1930s. In the 1940s, they weren't avowing it so openly. But it was pretty clear that there was a strong communist influence there. Reagan, as head of the Screen Actors Guild, had to make a decision on behalf of the actors who were not part of the strike as to whether the actors would cross the picket line. And Reagan decided, after consulting the leadership of the AFL-CIO, of which the Screen Actors Guild, SAG, was a member, that this was indeed a jurisdictional dispute rather than a labor management dispute. And under the rules of, this, of the AFL-CIO, in a jurisdictional dispute, then other unions were not automatically required to honor the picket line. So Reagan, like many of the other actors who had been on short pay during the war, they wanted to get back to making their Hollywood pay rather than their army pay, decided to cross the picket lines. As a result of this, Reagan incurred the very deep hostility of the radical union, people associated with which threatened Reagan physically and personally. They threatened, for example, to end his career by splashing acid on his face. Reagan reported this to the police and said, you need to better, you need to start packing a weapon. And he did. So Reagan felt that that's what the New Deal led to. Now, that's not actually a very good explanation. Either it's not quite sincere or it's partly ill-informed. Because if you remember your history, it was the Democrats, liberal Democrats, like Harry Truman, who were the staunchest opponents of communism. It wasn't the conservatives. Ray didn't have to go all the way to conservative to the Republican Party. But that's, that's the first thing that brings to his mind the idea that we've got to watch out for communism. And he began to distance himself from what I'll call the, the unreconstructed New Dealers like Henry Wallace in the late 1940s, who basically said, don't worry about communists. Reagan decided we do need to work, worry about communists. Secondly, there's a pocketbook issue. At this point, Reagan was in the top income tax bracket. He was making roughly a million dollars a year. Uh, it was partly because of this last contract that promised him too much. He, he would get demoted after that. But he was paying 90 cents of the last dollar that he was making. And a 90% marginal tax rate is pretty high. So there is a sort of a pocketbook element to his conversion. And then there is the fact that, yeah, his new employer, the person signing his paycheck, the company signing his paycheck, is an exemplar of American big business. 
And Reagan found himself, because of his work, having to talk about the virtues of American big business and American private enterprise. And he educated himself. Before this time, Reagan had not thought seriously about politics, really. He was a New Deal Democrat, but a pretty uninformed New Deal Democrat. As he informed himself, and in part because of these other influences, he convinced himself that government was getting too big. Now, some of this may have been what other people concluded. In 1933, at the start of the New Deal, a lot of people could say this is an appropriate response to the Great Depression and the economic crisis we're in. But by, 19, by the 1950s, the economy had fully recovered. We don't need that big government we needed back then. So Reagan always said that he didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left him. Now, that's what apostates to parties always say. But I wish I had a firmer answer to your question. But this goes back to it's one of the reasons that I, I find biographies intriguing. I can tell you what Reagan did. I can offer you surmise as to why he did it. But the wellsprings of human motivation are always very deep and almost always unknown, really, in any definitive way, to people outside and, and often unknown to the people themselves. But it's an excellent question. Other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Over here. Um, well, when you think of what Reagan did, he demanded a 600 sh uh, uh, ship uh, navy. Half of them are around, down the river right here. He, uh, uh, cut he cut taxes but didn't cut programs. He started the program of deficit financing and building up the national debt. Uh, when Johnson left office, the national debt was $300 billion. Uh, Reagan started something that's gone on and on till now we're up to $18 trillion. Absolutely right. And this is, something that, this is something that those members of the Republican Party, by which I mean every member of the Republican Party who reveres Reagan, every member of the Republican Party still reveres Ronald Reagan. This is something that they tend to ignore. What they look at is the Reagan who is the exemplar of, call it, philosophical conservatism. One of the things that makes many Republicans today a little bit uncomfortable is that Reagan governed rather differently than he actually orated. So I was asked uh, last, the week before last, I was in New York and I was making the rounds of Fox News. Uh, there are several Fox News shows and they wanted to ask me questions about Ronald Reagan. You know, the, I, I, like to, I like to think that the viewers of Fox News are the prime audience for a book on Ronald Reagan. Uh, that's what I thought until I was informed by people who know the publishing industry. Yeah, they like Reagan, but they don't buy books. Anyway, <laughs> but... I was asked the question, so could Ronald Reagan win the Republican nomination today? And I said that, yes and no. The no part comes if Ronald Reagan had already been president when he was running for the nomination. Because Ronald Reagan as president governed in a rather flexible manner. So Reagan is known as the tax cutter but Reagan cut taxes once and raised them five times, maybe six, depending on whether you count fee increases as, as taxes. Reagan was one who believed that there were these conservative goals, but that as an elected official, as a practicing politician, you should never let your goals, you should never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Reagan said, and this is, I did an interview with James Baker, his chief of staff and then secretary of the treasury, who said, and I can remember just sitting in his office and he said, if Reagan told me once, he told me 15,000 times, I would rather get 80% of what I want than go over the cliff with my flag flying. So that's Reagan the pragmatist. Now, you're absolutely right, and for the reasons I explained, Reagan's presidency was the origin of the structure, the built-in deficits we have. Now, as far as building the 600-ship Navy, this is something that I think is often misunderstood. It, very many historians even say that there was, in the middle of Reagan's presidency, this reversal, and the term among the academic historians, is the Reagan reversal. So the Reagan of the first term builds up the American arsenal, including the Navy and the nuclear arsenal and everything else, proposes SDI and all that. Reagan of the second term reverses course and negotiates things down. In this case, I'm going to give Reagan more credit than he's often given because I became convinced, on the basis of what Reagan himself wrote and said in his diary and elsewhere, that from the very beginning, from before he became president, Reagan had this 
visceral oppose, opposition to the idea of nuclear weapons. He thought that nuclear weapons were fundamentally immoral. And the, the strategy of mutual assured destruction, that human peace depends on these weapons, this nuclear arsenal aiming at each other. And that's the only thing that keeps the peace. Reagan said that's horrible. In fact, it is immoral. We need to get rid of this. And so Reagan, even before he became president, was trying to figure out how he could negotiate down, maybe even negotiate away, nuclear weapons. He was looking for a world beyond nuclear weapons. But the buildup of the first term was all about getting the attention of the Soviet Union, which had been building even beneath the caps of Daytona of the 1970s. In this case, Reagan's experience as head of the Screen Actors Guild in the 1940s came and served him in good stead, because Reagan understood how you bargain you start off with, the first thing you have to do is get the attention of the other side. If in the case of a labor union, you have to at least threaten to go out on strike. Because unless you threaten something, the other side doesn't compromise at all. With Reagan as president, it was build up this big nuclear arsenal, demonstrate to the Russians that they can't beat us in an arms race. If they want to race, we can outbuild them. We've got more resources than they do. Once we get their attention, as Reagan did during his first term, and especially with SDI, then when they come to the table, then we'll get some serious negotiation. So I don't see any fundamental break in Reagan's philosophy. The first term is about building up so that in the second term he can negotiate down. And in fact, Reagan was the great peacenik during his second term. Reagan was the first president to negotiate a serious arms reduction treaty the INF Treaty eliminated, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, eliminated an entire class of weapons, and it paved the way for the START Treaty, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty of the George H.W. Bush administration. Do we have time for one more question? Where's Amy? Uh, yeah, I think so. One more question, yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, sir, when it comes to foreign policy, could you speak in the transition between Carter to Reagan? Because it seems to, it seemed to me when I look back, there was two foreign two American foreign foreign policy going on during Reagan time. I'll talk a little bit about the the transition between Reagan and Carter. This is another case in which Reagan benefited from timing. Carter is remembered in Republican memory as the feckless president who lost Nicaragua and lost Iran, both countries of which had autocrats who were favorable to the United States. In the language of Franklin Roosevelt, they might have been SOBs, but at least they were our SOBs. But in 1979, the Somoza regime in Nicaragua fell to the Sandinistas, and the Shah of Iran fell to the Ayatollahs. And a lot of folks blamed Carter for this. And maybe they should have, maybe not. There were probably much larger issues. The world was changing in a way that was beyond American control. But Carter, by the beginning of 1980, in fact, right after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Carter had his own epiphany. And one of the things about Jimmy Carter was that he was almost embarrassingly candid in interviews with the press. You may remember the infamous Playboy interview in which he admitted to lusting after other women in his heart. I wonder what Rosalind thought. Anyway, but after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, he told the press quite openly that his thinking on the Soviet threat had changed 100% in the last two weeks because he had believed, and he admitted that he had believed, that Soviet, Soviet expansionism was a figment of Republican imaginations. And then the Soviets did indeed expand, taking over Afghanistan. And it was Carter who began the buildup, the military buildup of the 1980s. Reagan could simply build on top of that. So Reagan benefited from Carter's misfortunes. We call them failures, if you want, but misfortunes in foreign policy. The most, the most obvious failure in Carter's foreign policy, again, whether it was fully his fault could be debated, at the time of the election of 1980 was the 52 Americans who were held hostage in Iran. And Reagan could point that out as an example of how the American president has lost control of foreign policy. Um, I think I probably ought to stop there. We've gone longer than I'm supposed to go. You've been a wonderful audience, and books are going to be on sale somewhere or other around here. Thank you.